Welcome everyone to our members uh, community meeting for October uh, 2016. Bonjour à tous et bienvenue à notre rencontre du mois d'octobre qui se déroule en novembre euh, pour euh, le comité, euh, ou le, la communauté des membres euh, de Building Smart Canada. Uh, our meetings are brought to you each month by our members and communications committee, uh, Susan Kinleyseed, uh, Carl Villette, uh, Eric Poirier, and myself, Claudia Cortidorto. Le, les réunions mensuelles sont, euh, vous sont, euh, sont préparées et sont, euh, sont mises à l'avant par le groupe de communication et le, le comité des membres. Euh, si vous avez des questions ou si vous voulez faire partie d'un des comités, euh, n'hésitez pas, écrivez-nous à information à ibcbsc.ca. Our topic today is um, provided by uh, Susan Kinleyseed and John Dickinson. They'll be talking about the uh, Building Smart International Summit in Korea. Nous sommes très heureux d'avoir euh, Suzanne Kinnisaid et John Dickinson qui vont nous parler de, du euh, sommet qui a récemment eu lieu en Corée euh, et des avancements qui ont eu euh, et les discussions qui ont eu lieu au sommet. This uh, webinar is a go-to meeting. Uh, everyone is on mute, and if you have any questions, you may raise your hand or Enter in the uh, question in the question field on your uh, dialog box. Donc, euh, pour la plupart d'entre vous, vous êtes déjà familier avec euh, l'interface GoToWebinar. Euh, vous êtes toutes euh, euh, en mode euh, écoute seulement, mais si vous avez des questions, euh, n'hésitez pas, euh, si vous pouvez soit lever la main ou euh, taper votre question euh, dans le dans le, le, la fenêtre à cet égard. Euh, aussi, on prend toutes les questions en français, on va les traduire pour les, euh, pour les personnes, pour les deux présenteurs. Um, comme je disais, euh, restons en ligne après la présentation. Si vous avez des questions, euh, n'hésitez pas euh, et euh, nous pouvons traduire si vous avez des, des précisions à, à demander. So an update on our members community. Our uh, affiliate, um, sorry, our members have grown to 381 members across Canada, including international members. Our uh, Canadian affiliate program includes uh, Vancouver and Victoria, Calgary, Montreal, and Edmonton. Uh nous sommes contents de, de dire que le, 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 nos membres ne cessent de s'accroître. Euh, on a 381 membres euh, en ce moment et, euh, comme je vous disais, ça continue à grandir. Donc, euh, c'est très très heureux de ça. Euh, le groupe, le, 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 le programme d'affiliation euh, aussi continue de grandir. En ce moment, on a les euh, quatre affiliés, euh, soit euh, BIM BC, euh, le groupe de Calgary, le groupe de Nottingham ainsi que le groupe BIM Québec. Euh, et nous travaillons également sur euh, les provinces de l'Atlantique et Toronto. Oops. Um, our, our goal is a, uh, building a national network of excellence for Canada's built environment. Évidemment, tout ça dans le but de créer un, un réseau d'excellence pour le milieu bâti au Canada. Well, good afternoon for a few people and good morning uh, for the rest of you. My name is John Dickinson. I'm one of the uh, talkers today and I want to say to start out, I want to say that I appreciate the opportunity. This is the first chance I've actually had to chat with the uh, Building Smart Canada community um, and I hope you get some value out of this and I'll welcome your questions at the end. Um, as, uh, as was mentioned already, Uh, today's agenda or today's presentation is going to focus in on the outcomes of the Building Smart uh, uh, Technical Summit that was held in Jeju, Korea. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that those technical meetings go for four days and they're very, very busy and hectic uh, scenarios. And there really isn't an opportunity here or even a series of presentations to cover everything. So we will try and keep to the high-level items. 
Uh, so our agenda here is to give you a bit of background about how Building Smart International works and how the uh, technical meetings fit into that, and then cover some of the key topics that came out of that um, and how those tie into opportunities and benefits for Canada, and we'll take your questions and answers at the end. Um, I will leave it to um, uh, Eric to moderate things and let me know if there are things coming through. And I hope uh, you enjoy and get something out of this. Um, as I already mentioned, the technical summits are an international event. They're quite large. Uh, this picture here probably only shows about three quarters or two thirds of the delegates uh, that turned up for the last one. Um, we have about 100 to 150. I think this one round was about 150 plus delegates from 18 chapters worldwide. Uh, question is, based on our pictures uh, that you saw at the beginning, Susan and I are both hidden in this crowd. I'm not going to play uh, where, where's Waldo, but we're actually in there, hidden away. Um, we had a wonderful time down there, um, but it was uh, we were getting ready to go on a, a small tour of the island, and the uh, forecast was for rain, and it was quite forbidding. Um, the Building Smart International's primary business is the development and support of technical standards for the architectural engineering, construction, and FM industries. And to do this, it emphasizes three things, or it, it focuses on three things. The users as a source of the need, the process that is necessary to develop standards, and certification so that the standards can be trusted. And it, so that means at the moment there are three programs that underline how the uh, Building Smart International operates, a user program, a technical program, and a certification program. Susan is the representative for currently in the user program. I'm the representative on the technical program for Canada. We do not actually have, uh, as far as I'm aware, an individual representing certification program, but we are beginning to get involved there. The diagram that you see on the right-hand side of this shows the technical standards processes that are, or the standards program process that Building Smart International follows. And this process mimics or follows very quite closely the ISO processes. And the reason for this is that the goal is that standards that come out of Building Smart International are going to be mirrored and um, back or adopted by ISO um, or in, are usually submitted through ISO committees for adoption. And so it helps things if the process is, has the same sort of rigor and flow um, in Building Smart International as in the ISO. Um, the Building Smart Technical Summits uh, basically are an opportunity for all the representatives to get together. Now, delegates can represent all sorts of different stakeholders, just as we know the building, built environment has an awful lot of different stakeholders with different perspectives. They can be very technical representatives. They could be people who represent end user perspectives. They may have business needs that they're trying to get embodied or supported by standards. They'll have client perspectives. And in many cases, we have a lot of engagement with the academic community as well, because without them, the rigor and the science and the sort of thorough uh, investigation of all the different ways some of these things could be addressed wouldn't be brought in. The summits essentially provide an opportunity for all these people to come together and work towards the standards, have a face-to-face -face component, because it is very hard to talk about these topics all the time over digital uh, mechanisms, uh, VoIPs or uh, web meetings and things like that. There are two technical meetings or summits a year, one in roughly in March and one in October, and they move around depending on which chapter Building Smart can support it. Um, and in between, they're supplemented by some offline or virtual meetings that are held between the summits. And the numbers and frequency of these are usually associated with projects, and I'll get into that in a little bit. The summits themselves can have six or more streams or meetings in parallel, which means that when Susan and I were there this year in Jeju, we only attended about a third of what was going on. We simply couldn't be in so many places at the same time. The meetings that are held 
in uh, Korea or at any of the summits are usually broken down into streams that are following the same sort of structure that is in Building Smart International. There's a building for the vertical construction, infrastructure for more of the horizontal, the products that go into things, there's the technical side which te is um, basically attempts to try and harmonize all the stuff across the different areas. Regulation is a fairly new room and it is focused and interested, uh, well, we'll get into it later, construction and airport will actually be talked about a bit later by Susan. I'm sorry if I seem like I'm rushing, but we have a lot of things we would like to tell you, and I don't want to steal all of um, Susan's airtime as well, and I have a tendency to lecture at times, so I'll be careful. To give you a sense of what's going on um, within Building Smart, there were a few tables that were published, so you can get a, a concept. All of these blue boxes actually represent projects that were on the go at the beginning of the Korea Summit. Some of them are getting close to completion, others are only just getting started, and the Korea Summit actually created or generated a few new ones coming along. So we have them in the, the vertical construction, infrastructure, product, technical, regulatory. When we talk about the key outcomes of the summit, we'll mention a few critical ones that are relevant to Canada. Um, like I said, there were still even more. There were some special activities under the, uh, this is sort of the, uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't want to talk about the special activities right now. We'll get a chance to talk about them later. We did, I did mention that there is a new room for construction, a new room for airport, and there is some initial efforts into compliance to get things going. So some highlights from the actual event. The event was held over four, roughly four and a half days, depends on which extra or ancillary meetings you attended, um, and starts out usually with a meet and greet. Um, in this case, we got to go down outside and stand around a beautiful sort of resort and enjoy the lovely weather. Uh, a bit cloudy and overcast, but otherwise it was very pleasant uh, in Korea. I found it was a very nice place. You can see some critical and key people at these meetings. You can get a sense that there is a lot of emphasis. Even though we got four and a half days there, the emphasis, despite the beautiful setting, the emphasis was on the work. Now, what did I get out of the Building Smart uh, Summits, or what did I see that was coming through? One of the main things I noticed was that Building Smart International is ex enjoying a growth in it or in its influence. Its influence is expanding. And there were a number of reasons that this came out, and a number of reasons this is relevant for Canada. Um, Building Smart International now has established an advisory status with both ISO, the International Standards Organization, and SEN, the European Standards Organization. This is a rare arrangement for non-national representative bodies, and it occurs only when a body has been identified as being a domain expert. Building Smart International has now essentially become the domain expert for the AEC FM industry and how it impacts the standards. That means that as a body, it can actually provide advisory input on those development of the standards and the adoptions of those standards without having to do it through the national standards organizations associated with other countries. Gives it a lot of influence. There are also new rooms or interest areas coming out. Susan will get a chance to talk a bit more about the construction and airport, but essentially they were new and introduced at, uh, in Jeju, and they actually represent a very much a user or special perspective. Construction, the actual activities in uh, developing and realizing the built environment, and airport as a sort of major asset owner with particular needs that if we can address those, we can expand and deal with other major industries. Infrastructure was one of the most active rooms. Um, it is actually, in some ways, one of the biggest rooms currently. It is, um, most of you who are familiar with BIM will recognize that it came or initially grew out of a lot of emphasis on the vertical built environment, buildings, hospitals, that sort of stuff. Uh, but some of the biggest investments in built assets in the world are done actually on the infrastructure side. They could be uh, airports, they could be communication networks, they could be water treatment networks, they could be all sorts of things. 
right now there is a very big emphasis on transportation infrastructure and many countries are actually actively involved in this so new standards are coming forward for bridges for roads for rail and for tunnel and it's not like these standards are going to stand outside the current bin standards they're being incorporated and integrated in in a holistic fashion so Part of the push on this, of course, is simply re respecting that nationally or internationally, there are some very large initiatives that are underway. So, for example, bridges. There is work on standards for bridge, supporting bridges and maintaining them, design, maintain, and uh, operations by USA, France, Sweden, Finland, Germany, Japan. Roads, an entire European collection of countries are working on this, and Korea has actually submitted a road and rail public, uh, specification, which is now publicly available, and is being used as a sort of discussion point to help bring in all the other international interests. Rail, there is pilot projects going on in Germany, Korea, China, and probably many other countries. And infrastructure asset management is a very particularly uh, prioritized element. Um, Australia and Benelux in particular are looking at these very heavily. Uh, you don't just build it and expect it to last forever. You've actually got to manage it and treat it as an asset that you've invested in and one that you're going to maintain for the best of your um, country's benefits. UK has already extended um, the COBE documentation, which I believe was a topic of one of an earlier community presentation, to cover infrastructure uh, asset management information. Like I mentioned, specs, uh, publicly available specifications, have been published for road and rail, and by, by based on Korea's release and China has released something for railways. The main effort. Uh, being undertaken right now in the infrastructure projects within the Building Smart International is to harmonize these regionally developed standards into an integrated standard, one that could be adopted worldwide. Um, this is really important for Canada given our vast size and thus very large transportation and utility networks. If these standards come through and they focus on managing the assets, the these standards will be critical in how Canada moves forward, especially given some of the recent government announcements about investing in infrastructure so that the uh, we get money or value for our money and that we maintain them and address some of those sort of deficits that we have going on. The other major topic that I wanted to talk about uh, that was coming out of the Korea event was the semantic web. Uh, most of you may be familiar with IFC, the Industry Foundation Classes. That is the initial sort of embodiment of the BIM standards, the open standards developed by Building Smart International. It's embodied in ISO 16739, and we are now up to version 4 of IFC uh, with actually a couple of addendums already to help build the foundation that is needed by the infrastructure projects. Uh, focusing on things like alignment. The problem with it, of course, is that it's actually based upon an older uh, standards, Express G and STEP. Now, STEP is done in ISO and it mostly focuses on geometry. Express G is a language that is actually used to represent these standards. And unlike newer web languages that are out there like XML, um, the number of software libraries and tools that are out there to allow you to manipulate these sorts of uh, representations, it's not as popular beyond the use of the standards community. So this limits the ability for new tools, for new uses of the information that are actually captured in the models. And it also presents some challenges as extensions or as the standards are uh, improved to represent current uh, developments and needs. Um, so infrastructure developments actually require the development of new language elements and then new sort of ways of using those elements. Semantic webs is something that the World Wide Web Consortium has been working on for some time and they have a number of different standards out there. Um, so instead of using the 80s standards, we are Building Smart International is now looking at migrating from 
relying solely on those 80s based standards like Express and Step and moving into things that are a little more modern, the semantic web standards. There are a couple of reasons they're doing this and I can't get into all the technical details but I'll explain a few things here now. One thing is that if they can make or migrate the information over into more modern standards, the utility of the information embodied in those models becomes a lot more useful. We get extended value from them. We can link to and from them from uh, to the information in that model to other information outside those models. Um, and as we all know, um, engineering analysis often has to rely on the codes and the weather, uh, snow loads, wind conditions, um, exterior uh, environmental conditions. If you're going to use a model for that sort of analysis, you actually have to bring in a lot of extra information. It could be weather information, it could be codes information. Businesses do not run without contracts, so you need to link into that. Costing for construction, costing for parts and, and products, often it's very locally variable. Emergency responses is something that municipalities are looking into. Owners or FM operators definitely want the manuals associated with the projects or products that are actually in their buildings. If you can link these using modern day standards, you now have a much more rich and useful resource. The other thing the semantic web standards or transition to web standards will allow is actually to extend the current standard without actually having to rewrite it or rewrite it at the fundamental levels all the time. We can reference other standards that exist out there and there are some very useful and very commonly used standards like GIS that will want to be able to link the models to or link to the models from. Um, and then of course this allows if we can create all these dynamic links we can create them in a fashion that is uh, live and usable using resources or databases or other things that are now on the web we now have an opportunity to expand the number of applications that are capable of accessing the data either because they can parse the new standards and thus can consume the data directly or they can consume it as a sort of resource uh, where you can use other sort of interfaces to make queries and get the information back. Um, very short uh, summary of that in a visual fashion. If our building models, if our uh, BIM models, uh, IFC models are embodied in one representation, we don't want them sitting there on their own. We want them linked to infra structure stuff, we want them linked to sensors which might be dynamic, we want to link them to uh, GIS scale sorts of uh, mappings and topologies and relationships. It's going. The goal here is essentially to make the data more valuable, extend its shelf life, ease its incorporation uh, in, of use into new domains and applications, and even ease how we package the data into usable chunks for particular tasks. A building, uh, a model incorporates an immense amount of information, but most people don't need the whole thing. For business, if you're doing it for pricing or for maintenance or something, you only want a small subset. And the ability to link in and pull out chunks of the information that are contextually relevant is very valuable. This is the path to the future. The technology that the World Wide Web Consortium has introduced that is being looked at to uh, accomplish this is something called the Resource Description Framework and the Web Ontology Language. I'm not going to try and describe those right now. That is a seminar on their own and I'm probably not qualified to do it. Um, one thing I will say about them though is that they are very much focused on providing machine interpretable links between pairs of resources. So there will it will create a bridge from one resource to another and it doesn't mean the whole file necessarily, it could be an element inside a model and a reason for the link. What is that link for? What information will it provide? And that link can then be traversed. Um, these links are going to be provided as information outside the existing standard resources they reference. So they are not reliant on GIS representations or IFC representations or others or any of the things that we may be using. They are actually exist beyond those standards and can connect to all those standards. There is already an OWL version of IFC 4 approved and uh, to go. 
Um, if you have some more questions, I can try and answer that at the end, uh, but at this point in time, I think it's Susan's opportunity. Um, do you want me to transfer the presentation, or are you doing that? Here, I'll transfer it. Susan. Okay. Thank you, John. Hope I didn't bore anybody. <laughs> okay, Susan, you're now. All right, thanks. Um, and yeah, thanks for letting us uh, present here. Again, as John echoed, it, it can be challenging uh, given the quantity of information. Uh, so we appreciate your, your input of uh, the topics that are of interest to you. And if you'd like more information on any of those topics, uh, we're happy to follow up with other presentations or direct communications. So I'm going to carry on, as John mentioned, more from the, the user perspective. Um, we have uh, a number of rooms, and we all agree that it's a funny way to describe uh, to describe it. But essentially, a room is a forum. So, in the past, uh, typically a room uh, is focused on a specific topic area, and now, as uh, the user base uh, and the user perspective is uh, the user program is growing, uh, we now have a couple of new rooms that focus uh, more on the user side, uh, so gaining user requirements, um, uh, lessons learned, uh, precedents set, uh, that can feed into um, and provide the right information to the technical experts on which standards or which uh, parts of standards need to be developed further. One room that's been in existence for a little while uh, but still is slightly under the radar is the regulatory room. The regulatory's room, uh, regulatory room's remit is to standardize processes, workflows, procedures for open BIM in building regulations. Um, you'll see under the current activities two primary activities, e-submission guidelines and automatic code checking. So if you're familiar at all with any of those topics, you know that Singapore uh, has been issuing uh, e-permitting or e-submissions uh, based on a model for quite some time. Norway also is quite advanced uh, in this area um, related to automatic code checking. Uh, you'll see on the right side there the, the icons uh, development of logic rules for automated code checking. When we, when we do this at the moment, we are talking about one or two specific software platforms that exist that do this quite well at the moment and the discussion is well um, to do this kind of activity uh, do we need uh, an open standard to support that so we're not um, stuck in one particular platform but again we are talking about a model based uh, model based rule sets that go ahead and check your model for specific uh, elements that you've defined in your rules there is a request to Canada to identify uh, anyone we can in a regulatory position that is interested in this work. Uh, I know it's been mentioned NRC could be a good fit, uh, but there are multiple, uh, multiple opportunities out there um, depending on, on who has already developed an interest in this area and would like to participate. So if you know whether it's yourself or a colleague or, or, or someone you know that would be interested in getting involved uh, from a regulatory perspective, uh, please get in touch with us. So next on the list is the construction room. This one uh, is new. Um, it's led by the Strategic Advisory Council member Kojima Corporation. It's a construction company, very large construction company based out of Japan. Uh, they do have a call for participation up on the website, so if there are, again it's from the user perspective, if there is anyone uh, uh, within the field of construction, specifically working for a contractor, uh, interested in participating, uh, this is a good opportunity. Um, they're, they're developing their requirements and use cases uh, to see what should be uh, worked on in this room. Um, and as it's mentioned here on the slide, the initial focus is to evaluate site productivity improvements uh, through the use of BIM and, and open standards. Next we have the airport room. 
Uh, this room was launched just at this summit, uh, this summit here uh, in October, in, in September, sorry. Uh, it is led by the Asset Management Department uh, at Amsterdam's uh, Schiphol Airport. Uh, two gentlemen there uh, that have been very active on the BIM scene for quite some time and are, are very great people to work with. So um, there is a huge opportunity there as well for anyone in, working for an airport uh, or consulting to airports on uh, on this kind of uh, this kind of work to get involved. They're very uh, very open uh, to information sharing, and this is another good opportunity uh, to get involved and. And learn. You don't need to have a high level of knowledge uh, about uh, technical standards or IFC yet, but you do obviously need to know about your your business uh, that you're representing. Um, it was created for developing and deploying open digital standards, uh, specifically for the airport environment, and again, specific to asset management. Another new development uh, that is uh, on the user side, so the IUG, the International User Group, now has uh, on the Building Smart website um, a page for frequently asked questions. So you can see on my screenshot, if you're on buildingsmart.org, you look under the Users tab, you'll find it there. And each question is a drop down. It's been answered from a, a, a layman's or a, a user's language uh, and vetted through the technical community. Um, and that will answer many of your questions uh, around IFC specifically. Um, you know, IFC just doesn't work. Well, let's, let's go through and look at the specifics uh, about why it actually really does work well. We also ask uh, for any new questions to come in. This is meant to be an ongoing list uh, that will be maintained and, and kept up to date with new questions all the time. So. We have fielded uh, a number of questions uh, individually, so they get sent to myself or Eric or John or whomever in, in our Building Smart uh, committee. And we're able to field those questions and get those turned around to you uh, quite quickly. So next on the agenda, we have our Open BIM Guides. These are going to be new publications. Um, it's, again, meant to help uh, identify both to industry and to clients um, how to use OpenBIM in project delivery and lifecycle information management. The goal being, you know, to democratize the use of OpenBIM. There is, uh, as John mentioned, the, the prime focus has always been uh, the technical standards development. There is a, a huge amount of knowledge and experience in that technical community. And unfortunately, well, it now is the time. It's a now is the time that we can draw from that expertise uh, more towards the user community um, to attract to the masses. So, in this vein, we have two documents under development: both an industry guide to Open BIM, which will help you uh, navigate of how you're going to execute on the deliverables, and a and a slightly larger guide for the for clients to define their requirements specifically looking at uh, the different components, uh, what are you trying to achieve, and how do you put that into language and reference back uh, for, your, um, for the supply chain to deliver. I'm pleased that this work is being done here in Canada um, through sponsorship from the Société Québécoise des Infrastructures, through Building Smart Canada, and through S8 Incorporated. Next, we have uh, our list of BSI award results. Um, I really enjoy being a juror. Uh, Eric and Claudia also helped uh, evaluate these uh, these submissions, and it's really uh, it's really um, enjoyable to see such high level projects. They don't have to be large projects. Uh, they certainly encourage uh, as many SME submissions as possible. Um, but here are a few that won uh, to showcase. Uh, we're looking at design, construction, uh, operations, and maintenance, as well as a student category and a few honorable mentions. So under the award for design using open technology, it's not terribly surprising that, again, Schiphol Airport, uh, within their asset management uh, purview, won the award for design. Uh, they commented that by using the open standards, such as IFC and BCF, within their projects, they noticed uh, workflow 
the workflow and the requirements each are getting much more transparent and therefore they're able to keep the process and the data quality under much better control during the life cycle. Uh, again, emphasized by uh, the project manager there, um, the increase of the quality of the product and the commitment by the team. So we just found this to be a really ex uh, exceptional uh, project from start to finish, very well documented, and we will uh, definitely put on a presentation for you uh, specifically on that project from them in the future. For the award on uh, construction using, using open technology, this is a, a construction company called Tiongseng, and they built their own building, the Tiongseng Building. Um, <clears throat> we were really impressed with them for, uh, for using uh, DFMA, Design for Manufacture and Assembly. They integrated BIM with prefabricated components and made uh, prefabricated bathroom units. Uh, they found that by doing this, they had 33% reduction in construction time. Um, the reliance there, the nice thing about these submissions is they're very, they're very honest and brutally honest in terms of the open standards and how they work, which is exactly what we, we need. We need that kind of information. So uh, I really like their comment, reliance on open standards did not produce immediate interoperability. They went through iterations of model export sequencing and eventually came up with, um, with, uh, with a workflow that, in fact, was much better than what they had before um, using both Revit and Tecla. The workflow that they had developed using IFC maintained model integrity and made uh, reliable alignment of structural and architectural models possible. All in all, because of the open BIM uh, use in collaboration, they estimated approximately 80% time savings for the for the structural engineer. Under the operations and maintenance category, we have uh, BAM Swiss and BAM Deutschland. Uh, what we found really interesting with uh, with their submission for the Felix Platter Spital Hospital was that they they developed. Uh, well, they used a, a construction information management system with a virtual maintenance system and connected them bidirectionally with the CAFM system. And so we found that really interesting uh, from, I guess, from a, from a standards and from a uh, collaboration and integration point of view uh, to have achieved that, uh, to be recognizing what's the business driver, what are you doing this for, and how can we be innovative to achieve that uh, given the context. The best student project came from Penn State, um, not terribly surprising uh, considering uh, their, um, their experience in BIM, uh, but this gentleman, uh, Issa Ramaji, who will present to us next month uh, with his work, um, he developed uh, this innovative, agile new method uh, we have this discussion in, in Building Smart often in terms of uh, model view definitions and how we can make uh, more, agile, uh, more agile definitions of smaller parts, so more digestible parts. Some call them micro MVDs. And this paper really explored, or this research really explored this aspect in a novel way. So being able to uh, be innovative and agile um, and generating value in that process. Uh, this was an extremely interesting project. So we will present, uh, we will have uh, uh, Mr. Ramaji present next month for us on that. We had, um, again, same as, as the previous year, we get a number of excellent submissions. It's very, uh, we use a, a point rating system to a specific criteria uh, so that it's fair of who wins each category. But even then, we have a few that really deserve some kind of honorable mention for, for, the, uh, for what they've done. Uh, and this is one of those cases. So um, the, in Korea, uh, there was a project, the Susio High Speed Railway. Um, they had two high speed railways uh, intersecting, and they needed to uh, excavate underneath, uh, replace uh, all of the under parts uh, without stopping the, the without stopping the rail lines and 
So they put a lot of emphasis on uh, the modeling with 4D scheduling and um, in the purpose of generating uh, as you know safety and risk management as much as possible. So they really, uh, really did well with this. They developed their own portal uh, with 4D scheduling and scenario visualization for this uh, safety, uh, safety and risk management and scheduling. Um, yeah, just by the nature of the complex project. Uh, IFC was chosen to make the model updating time short, uh, and IFC converting module was developed for direct import into the virtual site. And so each, each modeling team, they could choose whichever BIM tool they were, uh, that was preferred to them, and simply upload the IFCs into the web server. Uh, so the virtual site would always be the latest and greatest. Um, the mo um, and the biggest gain uh, for them was that they could allocate more time to engineering works by reducing uh, the model updating time by using IFC. So the whole process for, the, for this difficult uh, works project uh, was completed uh, in a safe environment and as planned. Another honorable mention uh, to the M NMBU project, the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Um, this was uh, done by 4B Architecture. Um, and they, on the construction site, uh, they implemented uh, something that Skanska had started uh, and you know was sort of related here, the BIM kiosk on the construction site. And this... Um, this I really, from a user perspective, really liked uh, what they uh, what they captured in in terms of value for that. So um, they also used uh, handheld devices on site. They had five of these stationary computers called BIM kiosks. Um, the project itself required a high level of multidisciplinary coordination, which they used uh, Open BIM for. Uh, they co-located the design team. Uh, they practiced uh, v VDC methodologies, um, but what was nice is the tradesmen of all the disciplines used these BIM kiosks extensively to understand the complex drawings, uh, to identify and solve interdisciplinary issues, um, and essentially to build directly from the model. So they, they used uh, Celebri views that were predefined, so a tradesman would go up to one of these kiosks, the, the views were predefined, so they could easily navigate to what they needed to, uh, and and it just it grew uh, to be a very popular thing on site. Um, they also used uh, in the model room diamonds, um, so uh, you can imagine a, a, a three dimensional diamond hanging in each room, almost like a chandelier. And this was um, how you could view inside of the room, uh, essentially virtual reality. Um, they had one single federated model available for all participants uh, to ensure full transparency. Um, and the quote is that in this pilot project, Stats Big has proven it is possible to build based on BIM models and reduce the number of drawings. And our last honorable mention uh, is uh, again for a student's project uh, out of Poznan University um, in the Nordic. Uh, Nordic chapter. Uh, Mr. Fleming uh, focused very deeply, uh, very very um, open and transparent analysis from a from a structural point of view. Uh, do open standards work? You know how how is this really uh, helping the situation? And we were very pleased with how um, how unbiased he was doing his study and and brought clarity to you know to a lot of uh, a, a lot of the subject matter. So in his in his uh, in his words, IFC format met all the expectations. Uh, this format is editable and with a clear algorithm structure. Each participant of the construction process can open the 3D model of the building with freeware software. It's possible to exchange all information connected with geometry and material properties uh, thanks to IFC. And finally, we have, uh, John mentioned that IFC is on its fourth uh, version, IFC 4, uh, with a couple of, uh, of um, add-ons. Uh, 
uh, certification for that. That means that software will uh, go through the certification process to be building smart, certified to IFC4, import or export or both, uh, starting this month. Uh, the ISG implementation support group is where all of the software providers um, link into building smart for this activity. And that's under uh, Russell Steinman and um, Jeffrey Wallet. Membership in the ISG is open to all software companies. So if we, if you know of any software companies in Canada that would be interested uh, in either following the process for uh, one day being able to be certified or ready to be certified now, uh, you can uh, definitely direct them to us or to the, the link below on your screen. Um, what was it? I was going to say one other thing here. Oh, that's right. So um, IFC4, um, even though certification is starting this month, is already implemented in some software. So uh, pertinent to perhaps most of our users, Revit, uh, Autodesk Revit uh, 2016 already is, already includes IFC4. So, Claudia and Eric, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you, Susan and John, uh, for your presentation today. It was very informative. Uh, we will follow up in our newsletter for a link to this presentation and encourage uh, everyone to submit uh, suggestions and presentation requests. You can submit a request to information at ibc-bcs.ca. And thank you for coming. We'll see you next month. Donc, uh, merci à tous d'avoir assisté. Um, I might uh, actually, uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, on a couple de minutes. Uh, are there any questions to John or uh, Susan? Um, Est-ce qu'il y a des questions uh, sur ce qu'on vient de voir, là, John ou Susan? Um, vous pouvez soit lever la main ou uh, écrire, taper dans le dans la, la, la boîte, euh, euh, le chat. Euh, donc, je vous laisse euh, une couple de minutes. Moi, je, I, I do have a, uh, one question uh, for Susan. Um, when will the guides uh, that you spoke of be made available uh, to the wider audience? Um, well, I guess, barring any crystal ball, um, ideally, I would like to have... Um, a sh uh, I don't want to say a short version, but um, a starter version uh, for the next summit, which would be the beginning of April. Uh, this requires uh, the input from multiple experts within our Building Smart community. So I'm really, um, I'm really reluctant to um, to say that everything will be done by then because it really depends on how quickly they get back to me. Um, but I, I do have. Um, a good amount of content already. Uh, we do have a, a bit of a trial version of the industry guide already going out uh, through the SQI. Uh, we are always looking for more um, more resources in that regard. There is um, uh, there is recognition that this will uh, this work will grow because uh, already um, we're grappling with the concept uh, or the the notion. Is it really a, a guide? For open BIM, or is it a guide for open standards for the digital for the digital built environment, or for the built environment, I should say? Because what that implies is, um, there, for infrastructure specifically, we talked about um, extending the IFC model and using linked data. But there is a whole slew of activity that Building Smart members on the infrastructure and technical side have been involved in through the OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium. So. Uh, there's quite a lot of standards uh, uh, on that side that um, that should be part of the picture. Um, realistically, I think we'll have a um, a limited scope version ready for um, for the springtime uh, that we can share with our membership and anticipate and and in anticipation of a of a broader scope uh, second version uh, later on in the year. Excellent. Um, thank you for that. There's a question here. Um, in the submissions for the uh, BSI uh, BIM awards, uh, what were the type of contract mechanisms that were used? Uh, primarily, uh, more targeted, were there any IPD projects that were uh, submitted? 
Um, that's a good question. I don't remember reading explicitly uh, any focus anywhere really on, on the delivery type. Um, and I don't remember any specific submission only to IPD. Uh, that wasn't the focus. Um, but we could ask, you know, as we have these presentations and uh, we could ask them those specific questions when we have those presentations. Excellent. Um, the, uh, there's a question around uh, who's leading uh, the use of IFC uh, or, or Building Smart Ideals in infrastructure uh, in Canada? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we <laughs> We we do have um, we we do have some good input, but we don't have uh, we haven't found the right. Uh, you know, uh, let me back up. Uh, John mentioned it's a very uh, a very large room with a lot of activities. Even having one person uh, represent may be insufficient. Um, but that is a that is an opportunity that's on the table for for the right fit. Uh, I would echo that entirely. Um, the infrastructure room actually embodies many different little evils or many different wonderful projects depending on which perspective you take on it. And you could be in the transportation sector, you could be in water, you could be into uh, communications, you could be into energy, you could be into all sorts of things. Um, we have some organized, we, we could do with an academic perspective, we could definitely do with industry perspective so any um, we do not have a leader and even if we had one person step forward there's bound to be many other perspectives required so um, we would love to have it we we had somebody watching over this from a distance for a while but uh, they didn't have the resources or bandwidth to keep continuing um, there's a question around uh, is IFC in conflict with OFC in setting out infrastructure? I'm, I'm wondering if it's not OGC that's meant. Um, is uh, I'm not familiar with the OFC standard in infrastructure, but uh, OGC is, is IFC in conflict with OGC? OGC? The answer is no. No. <laughs> <laughs> in very short, um, um, the Open Geospatial Consortium and Building Smart International have uh, understanding and uh, ongoing working relationship with each, with each other. Many of the people who stand in and do work on IFC projects are actually involved in OGC projects and vice versa and we typically at our meetings have uh, cross representation uh, to bring the different perspectives and there is intense work with I think mostly within the infrastructure room to harmonize because the OGC standards tend to be on the macro scale like large the networks and all this stuff whereas building smarts internationals their IFC standards tend to be focused on how you build those individual elements and put them together and then how they get used and so there's a lot of there is overlap um, uh, usually uh, at the sort of uh, uh, portfolio level and stuff like that, but there's a lot of effort to harmonize all of this and to cross-link and make uh, relationships between those sound. I think there's also InfraGML that's trying to be developed between uh, OGC and Billing Smart. Um, yeah. All right, so uh, those are all the questions. We uh, Go ahead. Uh, I, I failed to mention one thing um, that could be of interest to one or some of our members. So alongside the, uh, the, in, the initiation of the construction room and the airport room, uh, it looks like next on the books uh, there's quite a bit of buy-in for a hospital room. Uh, so I know many colleagues around the country that, that work on or represent a hospital client and that may be of interest. Uh, if you want to throw your name in uh, to be aware of when that comes up. Uh, we do have a mention here that uh, Alberta infrastructure is moving towards BIM and IPD, so that's good to hear. Uh, we have uh, a couple of bastions of, of uh, BIM uh, in Canada, so we're uh, slowly but surely getting there. Um, so those are all the questions that we have. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give it back to you, uh, Claudia, to, to end the meeting. Um, thank you all for coming and we'll see you next month um, uh, and stay tuned our newsletter will tell you uh, what, when and where Donc, Merci à tous et uh, bonne, uh, bonne semaine uh, et on se revoit à la fin du mois Merci Merci